From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Joe Matthew, I'm Kaylee Lines. President Biden drops his budget, a $7.3 trillion plan for the next fiscal year that will go nowhere in a Republican-controlled House, but offers a window into the presidential campaign. Meanwhile, the president and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu engaging in a bit of a war of words over the weekend over red lines and Rafa as Ramadan begins without a ceasefire agreement. Our guests today, Acting Labor Secretary Julie Su and Carmel Arbit of the Atlantic Council. Kaylee, happy Monday and happy Budget Day. Indeed. This is time for the wonks to celebrate. The president traditionally, of course, that Monday after the State of the Union dropping his budget proposal. And I keep hearing the word aspirational. Yes, because while this may be many things that the president would like to achieve with this document, the likelihood any of it becomes reality yeah. depends on Congress, which he does not have entire control of at the moment. But as you say, Joe, really, we had a sense already of what was going to be in this budget because President Biden had a State of the Union last week where he outlined a lot of these policies. And he also highlighted his administration's achievement in the labor sector during that speech. Take a listen. The great comeback story is Belvedere, Illinois home to an auto plant for nearly 60 years. Before I came to office, the plant was on its way to shutting down. Thousands of workers feared for their livelihoods. Hope was fading. Then I was elected to office, and we raised the Belvedere repeatedly with auto companies, knowing unions would make all the difference. The UAW worked like hell to keep the plant open and get these jobs back, and together we succeeded. Here tonight! Is UAW President Sean Fain, a great friend and a great labor leader. Sean, where are you? Stand up. And Dawn Sims, a third-generation worker, UAW worker at Belvedere. Sean, I was proud to be the first president to stand on the picket line. And today, Dawn has a good job in her hometown, providing stability for her family and pride and dignity as well, showing once again Wall Street didn't build America. They're not bad guys. They didn't build it, though. The middle class built the country, and unions built the middle class. Joining us now for more on labor in the U.S. is the acting secretary of labor, Julie Sue. She is here with us in our Washington, D.C. studio. Madam Secretary, thank you so much for coming to Bloomberg Television and Radio on Budget Day. Thank you so of much all for having things. me. Yep. <laughs> and we saw within the budget almost $14 billion requested for the Department of Labor, more money specifically requested for worker protection agencies within it. What is the president trying to signal to American workers, not just with his State of the Union last week, but with the policies that he has proposed today. That's right. So you just showed one of my favorite moments of the State of the Union, mm -hmm. uh, what he said about workers, what he said about unions, his acknowledgment of UA President Sean, UAW President Sean Fain and just the historic wins that, he, that he's had. I think, you know, this president has been very clear that he intends to be the most pro-worker, pro-union president in history. And his support of workers on the picket line, his support of the working class demanding, uh, you know, their fair share of profits. Uh, he made a statement also about, you know, no billionaire should be paying a lower tax rate than a teacher or sanitation worker. The budget also reflects those values. And um, so for the Department of Labor, there is... Uh, a a budget request that has to do with connecting people on pathways to good jobs because his historic investments are about making sure that good jobs are being created in every community and also about enforcement. You know, the former is about building a high road to the middle class. And I always say we can't build a high road if we don't combat the low road. So we need to enforce, uh, you know, combat wage theft, combat misclassification and make sure workers go home healthy and safe at the end of the day. Within that 14 billion that Kaylee mentions, I see 2 billion for worker protection and empowerment. I think it's three and a half for shoring up the unemployment system. Uh, the overall ask is down from the last fiscal year, and I wonder if it's less than you asked for as acting labor secretary. I mean, I obviously support the president's budget. You know, it is... Uh 
we, we need to do, we need to both deliver on the things that, that the president has promised, and I think we need to be strategic and smart about how we use resources. Mm -hmm. I have said from the time I got to the Department of Labor that we need to use the full authority, budget, talent that we have to make life better for working people in every way that we, that we can. What we have seen are, you know, increases in the budget from uh, certainly the, the, the prior administration, yes, right. but also this one is, uh, has some uh, request for increase also because mm -hmm. we are seeing real issues in the workplace, including, you know, growth, child labor is a, you know, we need to combat child labor. It is unconscionable that children as young as 13 are working on the kill floor on the night shift uh, with toxic chemicals. That just shouldn't be happening in America. And our job is to enforce the law and our request for, um, for, uh, for a budget is to make sure we have investigators on the ground who can combat those kinds of practices. Well, and Madam Secretary, today isn't just budget day. It also marks one year of you serving as acting labor secretary in the U.S. And it, it's been quite a year in regard to the labor movement. There's been a lot of unrest, a lot of strike activity, a red hot labor summer, as we were describing it, extended even far beyond that. And the UAW is just is just one example. What are you bracing for going into your second year as acting as being acting secretary? Could we continue to see that kind, that level of activity so 2023 was a big year for working people, right? Unions uh, and their members made historic demands and won historic contracts, right? We saw on average double digit wage increases in the first year of a number of contracts from Hollywood to hospitality to healthcare workers, from dock workers to delivery drivers, auto workers, of course, you know, really um, set a high bar, uh, teachers, right? I mean, across multiple industries, workers, basically said, you know, we, we demand more equity. We want our fair share. And, uh, you know, I think we've also seen decades of a growing divide between CEO pay and frontline worker pay. And, and that gap that really, you know, the, the workers basically demanded a, a, a change to that. It's, it's time, it's time to do better. And the president has said the same thing. Um, and we're also seeing the biggest um, positive views about unions in a very long time in this country. Uh, so I think it's not an accident that the sa at the same time that workers are really organizing, they're showing solidarity with one another, and we have a president that's been very, um, you know, pro-worker, that mm -hmm. those things are, th th all this stuff is happening hand in hand. And so we expect that this next year will be another year that where workers do well. The president's been very clear. An economy that does right by workers is an economy that's stronger for everybody. Does that include labor action, though? I guess, is our question, are we going to see picket lines this year to the extent that we did last? Because the symbolism that we just saw of President Biden pointing up to Sean Fain carries a lot of weight. And there are a lot of folks in the country who, who might not associate themselves with the organized labor movement who might have been put off by that. What would you say to them? Well, like I said, public support for unions is at an all-time high. Some studies say that about 60 million working people in this country would join a union if they knew how or if they if, if it was easier to do so, right, if there wasn't so much um, backlash when workers try to do that. And we have seen that backlash, too. We've seen workers in many industries who voted to join a union and are still fighting for their first contract because, right, you know, it, it takes too long. Um, I would say that w working people across this country are not only those who are in unions are benefiting. But after uh, President Fain led the union to the a tentative agreement with the big three, non-union auto employers also increase their wages. Mm -hmm. And it's a, you know, when, when unions do well, it sets a high bar. You know, sometimes when I've been, uh, you, you know, talking to, uh, you know, at the bargaining table or, or talking to parties, sometimes what I'll get, I'll get a question. I'll get, I'll, 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 you know, I'll hear this pushback. Well, uh, you know, we can't pay a higher wage because it's too far above the market wage. And truly, President Biden's vision is that instead of telling workers that they need to keep accepting less all the time, we should question why the market wage is not itself higher. And so that's, you know, we support the ability of workers to get more money in their pockets and to have more secure lives through good jobs. Of course, one of the concerns, though, that stems from higher wages is that higher inflation may come with it, that you could end up in kind of a wage price spiral dynamic. Not to say economists think we're there right now, but looking at the labor market data, we had jobs day on Friday, obviously wages weren't 
super hot, but neither were the job gains. In fact, we saw downward revisions for the first few months of 2024. And if it all comes down to the fight against inflation that the Fed still seems committed to, it doesn't seem like they're going to be easing policy anytime soon. If we're not talking about policy easing for the next several months, what do you see happening to the labor market over that interim period of time? Could we see unemployment actually going above 4%? So several things. One is revisions are are, are part of the regular course sure. of jobs day numbers. That's why we also don't make too much out of any one month's numbers. Mm -hmm. If you look at the three month average, it's 265,000 jobs have been created over a three month period. Uh, you know, I don't think there is a better definition of a soft landing than that kind of job growth. And President Biden's economic policies and you know, what's happened in this country has defied expectations in every way. Uh, you know, job growth, long, uh, the unemployment rate, right, under 4% for two years and running. But the can longest it stay that years. way if policy stays this way? Well, night? and people have also always said, too, right, like you can't have uh, higher wages and control inflation. But the numbers don't lie. I mean, this is... Bidenomics. This is this is this has happened, and we want to see real wage increases because more money in workers' pockets is a good thing. More money in the you know at, at the kitchen table, right, where families are making hard decisions about what they're going to buy and how to you know how to right how how to how to live a secure life. You're never going to hear me say that making sure that um, working people get what they deserve is a bad thing. I don't think that we have to choose between uh, people, families paying uh, prices that they can afford and getting wages that are going to allow them uh, to, to feel some security. It's a false choice. Kaylee reminds us that it's been a year for you in this role as acting labor secretary. If Joe Biden is reelected and we are in the same predicament we are now with a divided Congress, would you be willing to serve in a continued acting fashion if you can't get a vote on Capitol Hill? Well, I've been so proud of uh, being able to serve uh, in this administration uh, for this president and to try to help deliver the kind of economy that the American people and the American worker needs and deserves. Um, I would be you know, proud to continue to do this because as the president made clear in his State of the Union, He's very clear-eyed about the moment we are in, about the challenges we face domestically and globally, uh, but also has a very clear vision for how we combat, the, the, you know, how, how, how we meet those challenges, right? How, how we combat inequality, how we uh, make life better for working people, how we increase, uh, uh, you know, global security. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's an incredible privilege to serve alongside uh, my fellow cabinet members to try to reach that vision. Maybe we're now in a world where confirmation votes are irrelevant. I mean, I'm still hopeful about yeah. it, and I've, I'm grateful for the support I've received from, from many, many senators. I think the process is really important. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we have a very big job to do in this country. We're coming out of a massive crisis, and, and we have to be able to deliver, and we're focused on delivering on you know, almost $2 trillion of investments in the president's uh, uh, investing in America agenda. We have to make good on those promises, and I'm laser-focused on doing that. I get up every day trying to figure out how to do that better and how to make life better for American workers. Well, we're delighted you could come and sit down with us for some time today. Thank you. Madam Secretary, thank you. Our acting Labor Secretary, Julie Sue, with us here on Balance of Power. Coming up, we'll take a deeper dive into what's inside the president's budget plan for 2025. That's next on Balance of Power, Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. President Biden today revealed his $7.3 trillion 2025 budget proposal, a plan that has little chance of actually becoming law in a divided Congress. Let's bring in now Bloomberg reporters Michelle Jamrisco and Gregory Cordy. So happy budget day to you both. <laughs> Michelle, we got a lot of this in the State of the Union last week, a lot of signals of what exactly the president was going to be asking for. But at the end of the day, that's what this is. This is an ask, and he knows that. We've described it, described it as aspirational. So what exactly is he trying to signal with this pretty lengthy 
document. Yeah. It's an ask. It's a letter to Santa, as one of my longtime <laughs> Congress editors used to say. Or if you're the White House, they say it's a statement of value. So they are repeating, as you say, a number of themes that they got to in the State of the Union. They want to speak to what they're, they're saying is a middle class, a strong middle class. You know, you hear all the time about building up the middle class from the ground up and the middle out, uh, building up the economy as such. And so they talk about a lot of ways in which they'll provide more relief for higher costs. They talk about housing costs, trying to provide this new tax credit there, child care, which has been on their domestic wish list for a very long time, uh, subsidy there, and then also uh, talking about bringing down drug costs in other ways, trying to do more negotiations with drug companies, uh, give another cap, uh, a wide-ranging cap on drug costs there. So different ways that they're trying to bring Americans' costs down and then saying that they're going to pay for all of this through new taxes on corporations and on the wealthy, including a, a billionaire tax uh, that would raise as, as much as $500 million over 10 years, they're saying. So they, they get out a lot of these values in this budget, but as you say, uh, very unlikely to come back to the president's desk for a signature. God knows they've tried on those tax hikes. They've not worked so far, so therefore the promise of a lower deficit becomes right. difficult uh, to make good on here. Uh, Gregory, this comes with a $30 million ad buy. I say this, the budget coinciding with a road show that follows the State of the Union. How much of this, I keep hearing aspirational statement of values, what was it, a letter to Santa? Letter to I like Santa. that. Yeah. How much of this is a campaign statement versus a presidential one? Yeah, the, the final budget before an election is always a, a, a political document, as was the State of the Union speech. Sure. A, a very political speech, probably about as political as you can get away with in that venue. Um, and, of course, this is, a, uh, this is going to be dead on arrival, especially in the House of Representatives. Remember, we haven't even passed last year's budget yet completely. <laughs> we haven't finished that cycle, and we're already starting the next cycle. Uh, but it, for the, the Biden White House, it certainly sets a, a, a statement of values, a statement of priorities. And it's going to be they are going to integrate this, uh, this official White House message with the campaign message to talk about how the president has delivered on some of these things. One of the, the biggest frustrations uh, from the Biden campaign is that some of the economic numbers are starting to look better, but that's not being reflected in the public opinion polls. And so they understand they have to aggressively get out there and talk about their issues and talk about what the president's already done and what he would do in a second term. Well, and he has been getting out there. He was in Georgia over the weekend. He's in New Hampshire today. He'll be visiting some other swing states in the coming days. But there is a primary in Georgia tomorrow on uh, both the Republican and Democratic side. We know who likely is going to be the winners. Can it teach us anything, though? And Trump could almost secure the nomination at that point, right? Absolutely. So there are four states up tomorrow, uh, Georgia, Mississippi, Washington, and Hawaii. Mm -hmm. The way they stack up, it might be the wee hours of the morning mm -hmm. when we hear from Hawaii before we know that President, former President Trump has officially clinched the nomination. What we're learning really isn't anything from any one of these states, but just that, look, this is going to be the uh, earliest, uh, the second earliest actually in history that we have both candidates clinching the nomination. President Biden is likely going to, almost certainly going to clinch yeah. uh, tomorrow as well. Uh, and so, but and these are also like two candidates that have been uh, central figures in, in American politics, American life, dating back half a century. Mm. These are two very well-known candidates. They've been campaigning for a long time. This is yeah. going to be the longest general election campaign. It already feels that way. But <laughs> objectively, it's going to be the largest, longest campaign in history. He's, of course, bringing the issue of Israel uh, with him. It's one that certainly the president cannot avoid at this point. He's been dealing with progressive outrage over this and said over the weekend in an interview that he would draw a red line on Israel invading Rafah. We are now one day into Ramadan. Are you surprised we're drawing red lines following his former boss's experience with that in Syria? It's been a gradual escalation, really. I mean, he was asked about a red line, and it did kind of send off flares for those of us who remember mm -hmm. uh, what, that, what that sort of terminology did under the Obama administration. I, I think the White House is, is understandably trying not to use that terminology, doesn't like that terminology, mm -hmm. but there is no secret, and, and they've kind of acknowledged this as well, is that there is kind of an escalation uh, in terms of the Biden and BB relationship right now. There is, uh, you know, certainly some love loss uh, in a long time, as they say, 50-year relationship there. A lot of uh, heat taken on both sides. Michelle, thanks. Michelle Jamrisco, of course, and Gregory Cordy with us at the table. Thank you both. Coming up, former President Trump doubling down on threats to hike tariffs on China. We'll have more on that next on Balance of Power, Bloomberg TV and Radio.
Mr. President, is there no concern that China could impose retaliatory tariffs or retaliatory actions that would make doing business in China difficult for American companies, which are dependent okay. on China for growth? That's okay. Yeah, sure. You know, we went through years and they didn't do it with me, and uh, they never pulled that trigger. That's a big trigger for them to pull. But even if they do, let American companies come back to America. Donald Trump speaking earlier today in an interview about the possibility of escalating tariffs between the U.S. and China. Joining us now to talk about this, what it might mean for our trade relationship is Tom Orlick, Bloomberg Economics chief economist. Tom, you're our China expert. You lived there and covered uh, Beijing for years. And I wonder your thoughts on the numbers we're hearing. He had floated a 60 percent tariff at what point and what that would mean if, if just not the end of our trade relationship. Uh, so... Donald Trump knows from 2016 that tough on China is a vote winner. So it's no surprise that on the 2024 campaign trail, he's banging that drum again. Um, the surprise, Joe, um, is the kind of the extremity of the position which he's signaling he's willing to take. 60% tariffs, as you mentioned, and as we saw on that clip, kind of if China retaliates, bring it on mm -hmm. type attitude. Um, so. We've run 60% tariffs through our model of the global economy, um, and the results tell us that at that level, tariffs would effectively turn off all imports and exports between China and the United States. So really, deglobalization on steroids. Well, and that's absent any retaliatory moves from China? That's just if the U.S. were to impose 60% tariffs, that's the effect it would have? So uh, if we think about China's exports to the United States, um, very often it's goods with a very low margin. Mm -hmm. Think about electronics, think about textiles. Um, so China's exports to the United States would certainly be turned off if a future Trump administration did set tariffs at that level. Um, now, um, what, would happen to US what would happen to U.S. exports to China? Um, well, that depends on if China retaliates or not. Um, we just heard the former president in that clip saying they didn't retaliate in his previous administration. Um, this may surprise you guys. Uh, take a breath. Um, but <laughs> that isn't entirely consistent with the reality of what occurred uh, in his first administration. The U.S. set 25 percent tariffs. China retaliated with 25 percent tariffs. So if there were 60 percent tariffs this time around, I anticipate that China would certainly retaliate and we'd see a serious blow to U.S. exports to China as well. Wow. And the impact on China's economy, unquantifiable, I suspect. Well, in our own as well, mm -hmm. surely. Pretty significant. Yeah. Uh, China is the biggest beneficiary of the existing mm -hmm. trade relationship. Yeah, right. The concern for Trump and his team is that it's unbalanced, so yeah. they'd be the biggest loser, but certainly no one would be better off. All right, Tom Orlick of Bloomberg Economics, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your expertise. And coming up, we'll turn to someone with expertise on the Middle East. Carmel Arbit of the Atlantic Council will join us as we're seeing tension between Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu. This is Bloomberg. What's happening is he has a right to defend Israel, a right to continue to pursue Hamas, but he must, he must, he must pay more attention to the innocent lives being lost as a consequence of the actions taken. He's hurting, in my view, he's hurting Israel more than helping Israel by making the rest of the world, it's contrary to what Israel stands for. And I think it's a big mistake. That was President Biden on MSNBC over the weekend. Joining us now is Carmel Arbit, non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Carmel, always great to have you on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. President Biden went on in that interview to talk about the idea that if Israel were to move into Rafah, of course, which is on the border of Egypt and Gaza, where a million people have sought refuge, he called that potential move a red line. But what is a red line worth if no consequence comes with it? The U.S. isn't about to stop supporting Israel. So what did that mean? Thanks so much for having me on. What we're seeing here is rising tensions between Biden and Netanyahu that were in some ways inevitable. You have a far right wing government in Israel and you have a center left government in the United States. And so the fact that they've been able to lay aside these tensions up until this moment is actually quite remarkable. And we've seen historically U.S. presidents who have had to deal with Bibi eventually hit a breaking point. 
Um, and so now what we're hearing is a, a shift in rhetoric from the White House, not yet a shift in actions, but rhetoric changing where they're pushing the Israelis towards a more humanitarian centric approach and making seri putting serious pressure on them not to go into Raqqa. That rhetoric is certainly coming from more Democrats here in Washington. Carmel, we spoke earlier today with Congressman Seth Moulton, a Democrat from Massachusetts. This is a former combat veteran. He's on the Armed Services Committee, and he spoke directly about Prime Minister Netanyahu. Let's listen to what he said. If Netanyahu continues killing so many innocent civilians, he's going to lose the war because he's just serving as a recruitment tool for Hamas. So the, the issue here is that Netanyahu fundamentally has to go. What he's doing is, is, is morally bankrupt. Uh, it's militarily uh, bankrupt. It's not going to work. And so therefore, what he's really doing is pursuing his own interests and, and, not, and not Israel's. Carmel, is the congressman right? What would happen if Benjamin Netanyahu were removed from this scenario we're in? Yeah, I think it's important to remember that there is still wide support in Israel across the political spectrum for this war, and particularly for the necessity that Israelis feel to defeat Hamas and remove them from power. That's not a view that is unique to Bibi Netanyahu. So while you, Netanyahu is losing popularity, we're seeing his poll numbers continue to tank at the expense of others in his war cabinet who are more centrist, who are seen as more serious in this moment, we would still see this war continue even if Bibi weren't at the helm. Now, how they would be dealing with certain issues, whether it's the delivery of humanitarian aid or, frankly, the relationship with the United States might look very different. Sure. And on that relationship with the United States, as we saw the president announced last week that he wants a port constructed on the Gaza coast in order to expedite getting humanitarian aid in, in addition to the airdrops uh, that the U.S. has already begun. The U.S. is having to go around an ally here. And regardless of whether it's a matter of who's at the top or just a, a, a kind of fractious nature of this relationship right now, are we also seeing signs that the U.S. doesn't actually have that much leverage over Israel and its decision making when it comes to this conflict? I think it's important to take a, take a step back and look at whether or not it's really going through or working with. The United States has said it's going to set up this port. It's going to take about two months to get this up and running. And what we're looking at here is really going to be a drop in the bucket when it comes to the necessary aid for the burgeoning humanitarian crisis in Gaza. So the first piece of this is that this is not going to solve anything. It's not that the Israelis haven't done it, and therefore the U.S. is doing it or going around them. They're also going to be doing this in coordination. It's in all likelihood the Israelis are going to have to help them set this up. They're also still going to be inspecting any ships that are coming to that port. Likely they'll do that in Cyprus. So there will be continued coordination. But what we're seeing is a complete inability to deliver aid inside Gaza in any meaningful way, which is a result of this ongoing chaos in Gaza and the fact that the Israelis don't have a plan moving forward. And we've discussed this in the past. They have no means of distributing aid. Roads have been destroyed. They can't secure areas. And so there's no real way future to have a meaningful impact on this humanitarian crisis absent that ceasefire. Yesterday was the beginning of Ramadan, Carmel. Does that mean that any chance for a ceasefire will now have to wait another month? No, there was a lot of hope that a ceasefire would be reached before Ramadan, where Ramadan served as a deadline. And we are, of course, beginning Ramadan today. Negotiations are continuing. They are continuing to mull forward as both sides blame one another for why there hasn't been a breakthrough. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a possibility of having a ceasefire during the Ramadan holiday. Of course, that's in the more near term. Returning to kind of the the sparring back and forth via public uh, media interviews between Biden and Netanyahu this weekend, Netanyahu also rejected Biden's call for a two-state solution to the conflict. He said Israelis resoundingly reject the attempt to ram down our throats a Palestinian state. So in the longer term, Carmel, are we any closer to a long, long-term end game? I think we're not any closer to a long-term end game. We are getting closer to an end of the war. The Israelis have made significant inroads in terms of taking out Hamas battalions and are thinking very strategically about what the final phases of war look like. 
But what they are not thinking about seriously is what happens in the day after. And while Netanyahu has repeatedly said, primarily for his public constituents, that he does not support a two-state outcome, he's also feeling increasing pressure from the international community, the United States, and countries with whom he hopes to normalize relations, like the Saudis, on what a day after can and should look like. But the Israelis still aren't there yet and aren't ready to get serious about it. Carmel, it's great to have you back. Our thanks to Carmel Arbit, non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Coming up, the Biden campaign has a new ad out that takes on the president's age. Can we do one more take? Look, I'm very young, energetic, and handsome. What the hell am I doing this for? <laughs> we'll bring in our panel next. Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano with us coming up on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. I'm not a young guy. That's no secret. But here's the deal. I understand how to get things done for the American people. Donald Trump believes the job of the president is to take care of Donald Trump. I believe the job of the president is to fight for you. A new ad out by the Biden campaign addressing persistent concerns over his age, while a super PAC supporting Donald Trump came out with its own ad taking a slightly different tack on the president's age. We can all see Joe Biden's weakness. If Biden wins, can he even survive till 2029? The real question is, can we? As we assemble our political panel now for their take on this, Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, is with us. Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University. Great to have you both here. Jeannie, that's a $30 million ad buy for Joe Biden. He's trying to tackle the issue head on. Is it smart to own it or is he simply reminding people about his greatest weakness? Yeah, it's smart to own it. It is one of his greatest weaknesses, as you mentioned, and he's got to tackle it straight on. And he's got to make the case that he made at the State of the Union that we saw him make on the late night show and that he is trying to make out on the trail in the last few days, which is that with age comes experience, comes wisdom and the ability to get things done and to remind voters that there are worse things than being old. You could be crazy or dangerous. And that is what we are going to walk into wow. a message of I may be old, but I'm not crazy and dangerous. And that's where we're headed. So it's going to be a long, ugly campaign. Can see it coming forward. Indeed. And we have about eight months of that to uh, <laughs> look forward to. So Holy Jeannie Monday. says you got to face it head on, Rick. But is there such a thing as leading, leaning too hard into the whole I'm old thing? Yeah, it's a it's 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 an art form, right? We've heard him make fun of himself, mm -hmm. and that's sort of a nice way to deflect it. He did it effectively in uh, the State of the Union. I think that uh, this is all part of a regular campaign plan, though. You, uh, his problem is with young voters, uh, voters of color, especially those without college education, Trump Biden swing voters, those who voted for Trump in sixteen and voted for Biden in twenty. These are people who he has to have in order to win, right? This is not even like making up new ground from 2020. This is, if you're not, go if you're gonna win, you have to have these back into your coalition. And the one thing that they scream out loud is that he's old and they're not ready to vote for someone his age. So he's gotta get his own coalition back. And that's what this buy is. This buy is targeted toward them. Uh, who buys Comedy Central if you don't have a young person issue? <laughs> you know, who buys ESPN and March Madness if you don't have working class people who have, you know, uh, time to spend watching sports? So the bottom line is, I think he's trying to shore up his campaign right now. And they placed a bet. They knew they were going to do this right after the State of the Union. And they got what they wanted. They got, you know, over 30 million people watching the State of the Union. A good performance by Joe Biden. Can they keep this momentum going through this ad campaign? And will it continue to keep, keep you know, soliciting funds into the campaign like, like they were able to report an extra $10 million, you know, overnight after the State of the Union? I find it fascinating, Rick, Jeannie, and Kaylee, that the Trump and Biden campaigns are both on TikTok now, right? But they are now both 
I guess, supporting, potentially banning TikTok. It gets a little more complicated with Donald Trump. You have to listen to what he said earlier today on CNBC, because we all remember he was for a TikTok ban at, at one point, and he seems to have changed his tune. Here's what he said. I could have banned TikTok. I had it banned just about. I could have gotten it done. Uh, but I said, you know what? But I'll leave it up to you. I didn't push him too hard because, you know, let them do their own research and development. And they decided not to do it. But as you know, I was at a, the point where I could have gotten it done if I wanted to. Uh, I sort of said, you guys decide. You make that decision because it's a tough decision to make. He wrote on Truth Social, if you get rid of TikTok, Facebook and Zucker schmuck will double their business, referring to Mark Zuckerberg here, of course. It turns out that Donald Trump recently met with Jeff Yass, a hedge fund manager, big Republican donor, who has a massive stake in TikTok. And it turns out as well that Kellyanne Conway is working for the Club for Growth, uh, which uh, is now a big financial backer, I guess, or Jeff Yass is of the Club for Growth. I'm trying to get all of the dots connected here, Rick. Is this why we're seeing... Donald Trump changed his tune because this is up for a vote on Wednesday in the House. Yeah, I love his tune. Uh, this is a really hard decision. I'll let somebody else make that decision. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so far, the buck does not stop on his desk. Uh, yeah, look, I think this is hard because it's kind of the old theory of bank robbers. Why do they go to the banks? Because that's where the money is. Why do you go to TikTok? Because that's where the eyeballs are. <laughs> and so yeah. you can't really fault the campaign for going where people are. Uh, uh, and I think that then that has to inform their decision making when it comes to the policy. I think Biden's pretty clear about this. The, they don't want the Communist Party getting access to data about people who are on TikTok. And so there has to be a break. Mm -hmm. uh, Donald Trump, you know, it's a little more complicated as you played in that that tape uh, as to what his position is. But the bottom line is, I don't think anybody is going to withstand the pressure uh, domestically right now of pushing back against uh, the CCP. Uh, Chinese Communist Party should not have access to our data, and there ought to be a way to circumvent that with, with TikTok and, and, and Binance. Well, and in fact, there's a whole committee now in the House of Representatives dedicated to the strategic competition between the Chinese Communist Party and the U.S. And we actually spoke with a member of that committee earlier today on balance of power. Congressman Seth Moulton, a Democrat from Massachusetts, gave us his view on this TikTok bill. I hope it gets a vote. I think that, that we don't need the Chinese Communist Party uh, telling our kids what to watch online, which is essentially what's going on here. And I just want to see TikTok survive and thrive, but under American protections, in American hands. And Jeannie, he made a point to make it clear to us that this is a bill that would require ByteDance, the Chinese owner of TikTok, to divest it, not a bill just to outright ban TikTok. That would be the consequence if that divestiture doesn't happen. So this will get a vote in the House on Wednesday. President Biden says he'll sign it if Congress passes it. Do you actually believe they will? Will this happen? You know, there's so many factors. I think it may get a vote by Wednesday when they leave. Um, with Donald Trump sort of iffy on this now, I wonder how much sway he will have. He is clearly, clearly not forgiven Mark Zuckerberg for what he saw as interference in the 2020 election. Um, beyond that, though, I think there are real questions whether this passes the Senate. And I, you know, look at Mark Warner and others who say, number one, does it make sense for the U.S. government to be targeting one company? But even more than that, and I have real, real questions about the issue of privacy and regulation. TikTok is by no means the only way that our private information is getting into the hands of people around the world. And so it is a talking point to say you are really going strong on the CCP. But the reality is, and there's so much research out there about this, it is getting out in other ways. So if they want to do a comprehensive protection of our privacy, they should go ahead and do that. But for my money, to do just one company is to do a talking point that yields very, very little in the end for our protection and security, and that is troubling to me. And, of course, the campaigns will have to figure out how they're going to reach young voters if they don't have this platform. Jeannie Shanzano and Rick Davis, our political panel, will be sticking with us because coming up, we have to talk about Senator Katie Britt, the Republican from Alabama who gave the response to the State of the Union, is now having to respond to backlash over that speech she gave on Thursday night. We'll have more on that next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio.
very specifically said, this is what President Biden did during his first 100 days. Minutes after coming into office, he stopped all deportations, he halted construction of the border wall, and he said, I am going to give amnesty to millions. Those types of things uh, act as a magnet to have more and more people here. I then said in his first 100 days, he had 94 executive actions, and those executive actions didn't just um, create the crisis, they invited it. That was Republican Senator Katie Britt of Alabama addressing her response to Biden's State of the Union on Fox yesterday. Joining us now, our political panel, Rick Davis, partner at Stonecourt Capital, and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University. And Rick, something else she has uh, started to get criticism for is the fact that a story she told, a, a graphic story, frankly, in that speech about a woman who was trafficked and gang raped. That woman she met with apparently was not trafficked in the United States, and the years in which she was held uh, in captivity were 2004 to 2008, when George W. Bush was pre uh, president. It, it just didn't happen during the Biden administration. Does that invalidate the arguments she was trying to make? How politically damaging is that for her? Yeah, I think without that story, we wouldn't be talking about anything other than kind of the presentation. And right. it would be a Saturday Night Live joke, and we'd all be laughing about it. But in this case, it's actually a pretty gross misrepresentation. And I can see how uh, writers of the speech thought that this would be dramatic and this would be something that she could punch through and it would scare people because so much of the immigration messaging is fear mongering. Uh, but they just overshot their runway. I mean, this was not something that would stand up to the light of day. Uh, nobody was in the room, I guess, who said, oh, wait a minute. You know, this happened in 2004 to 2006. Uh, aren't we going to bring, you know, criticism onto ourselves by doing something that old? It has nothing to do with the first 100 days of the election. As you heard, Katie Britt did a very nice job articulating the first 100 days and the disaster that was the Biden administration decision on immigration. Uh, but this had nothing to do with that. Carla Jacinto is... Uh the woman's name, Jeannie, she also said she met the senator at an event at the southern border with other government officials uh, as opposed to one-on-one, -on -one, as Britt stated. She suggested some things and stated others here. It does make you wonder uh, what's going to happen to Katie Britt following this little implosion in the Republican response. Does this damage her career politically? You know, I don't think it will potentially long term, you know, just to add to the issue of the victim, she also said she does not speak to politicians, neither in Mexico nor the United States. She was shocked that she was used in this way and that it has inflicted damage on her. So all of these things you need to take seriously. In terms of, of, of Brit, you know, I think and to a certain extent with all the focus on the presentation, this has been given a little bit of a pass because the reality is this this speech was not hoisted on her. She sat there. She said, I spoke to this woman. This was our interchange. This was our experience. You know, I appreciate hearing that, oh, somebody in the room should have stopped and said, wait a minute. What about the senator from Alabama herself? Do you actually get on national TV and say you had a conversation that you did not have and pretend it occurred when it did not happen? So that is troubling. And, you know, the other part of this is if they are saying that the disaster at the border is something that needs to be addressed, then surely there is a real story to be told. Why not tell that story? So this really diminishes their entire argument about the need to address the border. So from all of those perspectives, this is really troubling for the GOP as it pertains to immigration. You know, long term, I think the senator will survive this. But short term, if there is a real disaster at the border, and I believe there is, there are stories to tell that aren't based on lies, fabrication and hurting the victims of sex trafficking. And Rick, finally, to Jeannie's point about Senator Britt is a young senator. She's 42 years old. She's only 14 months into, into her term right now. And frankly, the likely Republican nominee has been caught in lies on several occasions, and it hasn't damaged his political popularity. So does this hurt her trajectory in her political career? Probably not. I mean, you got to remember the kind of uh, communication that uh, Republicans listen to. It's not MSNBC and CNN. Mm -hmm. It's Fox News, uh, Breitbart, and, you know, Newsmax. So those won't beat her up over this speech. They'll laud it and say that she did a great job. Mm -hmm. uh, we live in two Americas right now. You know, the Republican America that has different... Uh, 
uh, news cycles than or news sources than the Democrats do. And and so, yeah, um, we're going to go along on a parallel scale. Rick, thanks as always. Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano, Bloomberg Politics contributors, getting us started on this Monday on Balance of Power. Check out the Washington Edition newsletter for the stories we've been talking about. Find it on the terminal and online. Thank you so much for joining us here on Balance of Power. We'll see you back here tomorrow on Bloomberg TV and radio.